Amen. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, you can give it up to Jack. Awesome. Okay. Are we ready to continue our series in Acts today? Are you ready? All right. So Acts 23, go ahead and start turning there if you have your Bible app or your Bible. It will be on the screen behind me as well. And uh, really excited as we kind of wind down our series looking at the great adventure the journey through the book of Acts. Now, let me, I, I kind of regularly ask this question, but by a show of hands, how many of you have been encouraged by this journey through the book of Acts? Okay, a lot of you, a lot of you, and uh, we are excited as we kind of hit the home stretch into what we're talking about today in Acts chapter 23. We've been talking a lot about sort of the main character, not just the only character, but one of the main characters in the book of Acts. We read about Saul, who turned into Paul. He got saved radically. And Paul, when you look at uh, what God did with him and how he used him mightily, he, he literally wrote over 30% of the New Testament. And so Paul is, in reality, a superpower, he is, in fact, a faithful ambassador of Jesus Christ, a true hero of the faith. That is Paul. And from what we've seen so far in Paul and his gospel influence, 13 chapters in now, you may be thinking, or you may have been thinking through this series, you know, I, I, I'll never be like Paul. You know, I, I can't relate to him too much. You know, we read about how much of a superpower in the faith he was and what God did through him and his life. So, I, you know, I, when, I, when I look at his life, you maybe have thought this or you may have, you know, be thinking this, that, you know, Paul's life simply reminds me just how inadequate I am. Because nobody can compare, nobody can come close to Paul the perfect. And so I, I would just want to encourage you this morning you know, maybe this is the reason why we oftentimes disconnect from the hall of faith, those who've gone before us. And we see the, the magnificent, amazing things that they did for Christ in terms of spreading the gospel and making disciples. But maybe the reason why we disconnect from the hall of faith is because we often forget that they were human just like us. And we see the highlights in the book of Acts of the magnificent, amazing, supernatural things that Paul and the believers did, but they were just like, they were just human. And, and I, I want to ask you this question. Do you think Paul needed encouragement? How many of you think that Paul needed encouragement? Show of hands. Okay, so today we get to breathe. We get to breathe because Paul, in fact, being human, he needed encouragement. And uh, I think that after today's message, Lord willing, and through, his, through the power of his spirit, I believe that you and I can relate more to Paul than you think after what God has got for us today. The title of my message today is Encouragement, say encouragement, encouragement from above. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we give you this time. We, uh, Lord, we, from the very beginning of this service, we have laid down all of the things that burden us and keep us weighted down. Lord, we've given it to you and want to keep giving it to you. We don't want to grow weary in giving, Lord, the burdens that you want to take from us and carry them so that we can follow you. And Lord, I realize that this morning people are still carrying weight in the burdens of life and the angst of relational stuff and, and just life in general. I pray that you would encourage Encourage us from your spirit. Uh, Lord, speak to us. Do something that we can never do, which is a supernatural change from the heart and from the inside out. I pray that you would get me out of the way today and pray that as we look at Paul, your servant, you would encourage us this day in Jesus' name and all God's people said. Acts chapter three, uh, 23, starting in verse 1. Here we go. Gazing intently. I uh, just want to stop there. This just simply means that Paul, in front of the high council, who is the Sanhedrin, he is gazing intently. He is staring down. Okay? That's what's happening. So gazing intently at the high council, Paul begins, Brothers, I have always lived before God with a clear conscience. Instantly. Say instantly. Instantly, Ananias, the high priest, commanded those close to Paul to slap him on the mouth. But Paul said to him, God's going to slap you, you 
corrupt hypocrite? What kind of judge are you to break the law yourself by ordering me struck like that? Those standing near Paul said to him, do you dare to insult God's high priest? And Paul says in verse 5, I'm sorry, brothers, I didn't realize he was the high priest. Paul replied, for the scriptures say you must not speak evil of any of your rulers. Paul realized that some members at the high council were Sadducees and some were Pharisees. So he shouted, brothers, I'm a Pharisee, as were my ancestors. And I'm on trial because my hope is in the resurrection of the dead. He is risen. Good. Just making sure you're alive. Wake. He is risen indeed. Verse 7. This divided the council, the Pharisees against me. Uh, I'm sorry, against the Sadducees. For the Sadducees say there's no resurrection or angels or spirits, but the religious law uh, who were, sorry, some of the teachers of the religious law who were Pharisees jumped up and began to argue forcefully, we see nothing wrong with him, they shouted. Perhaps a spirit or an angel spoke to him. As the conflict grew more violent, the commander was afraid, listen, that they would tear Paul apart. So he ordered his soldiers to go and rescue him by force and take him back to the fortress to safety. That night, the Lord appeared to Paul and said, be encouraged. Be encouraged, Paul. Just as you have been a witness to me here in Jerusalem, you must preach the good news in Rome as well. Now, up to this point, there are about 10 years that have passed since Paul was commissioned into his first missionary journey way back in Acts chapter 13. Three missionary journeys later, the heat is turned up and Paul's life seems to be at greater risk. I do believe that Acts chapter 23 is a marker in Paul's life and ministry, one that would set the course to the rest of his life and legacy. Uh, I would imagine that all of you, if not all, most of you have seen the classic film, The Wizard of Oz. Yeah? The Wizard of Oz. This is a, a classic film. The plot, of course, a tornado rips through Kansas, and Dorothy and her dog Toto are whisked away in their house to the land of Oz. And they, they follow the yellow brick road toward the Emerald City to meet the wizard. And along the way, they meet a scarecrow that needs a, the scarecrow needs a, a brain. All right, good, good. We've all seen this. A tin man missing a heart and a cowardly lion who wants, say, courage. He wants Courage. Now, the cowardly lion famously lacks courage. Talk to me, because we're an interactive bunch. What are the things that stand in the way of courage? Fear, rejection, doubt, unknown, being made fun of. So many things, but I think I heard it the first, uh, at the first blush of this question, and that is fear. Everybody say fear. The lion in the movie, The Wizard of Oz, he is scared of his own tail. And he is skittish at the slightest sign of danger. And his companions constantly have to encourage him to keep going on their journey. Th this is interesting. Encouragement is needed because something crucial is lacking, which is courage. Courage. And although Paul was anointed and mightily used by God, this does not mean he lacked courage. After all, Paul was human, and he needed some encouragement desperately. And this is what we see here in Acts chapter 23. Question, what does encouragement look and sound like? Talk to me. Giving somebody hope. Say again. Support. Ooh, that's good. Truth. Positivity. Calling out good things. Good. 
Gratitude, thankfulness, excellent. Anything else? Hope, excellent. You know, humanly speaking, encouragement looks like fans standing in a sports game. And, you know, they're watching and they cheer and they shout, you've got this, you can do it, go, go, go. All right? And this is what it often looks and sounds like when we're talking about encouragement. Obviously, encouragement like this is incredibly exhilarating. But encouragement from above looks and sounds differently because courage from above is supernatural. It is supernatural. It is what Paul sought and he longed for. Now, I know that I'm preaching to someone today who's in desperate need of this kind of courage today, encouragement from above. I have to, I have to believe that there are uh, some of you sitting, you may be sitting next to that person who is worn down, torn down, spent, exhausted, and what they need, what we all need is courage from above. You see, spiritual encouragement is courage directly breathed into and in, in, uh, into you straight from the Spirit of God. This is supernatural courage beyond what human encouragement provides or can even provide. This message is for those on the journey and mission with Jesus who are growing weary and fearful and, yes, even discouraged. And I want to encourage you with supernatural encouragement from above. God knows we all could use this kind of courage in the days and in the hour that we are living. Amen? Okay, so I want to leave with you then three uh, keys or three points or three truths in terms of what is courage from above. Here's the first thing. Do not be afraid of I can't. Do not be afraid of I can't. Now, I realize this may go go against everything that you've thought and even practiced. It seems to be kind of uh, an antithesis, an opposite thought in the world that we're living. You know, we've we've adopted this, you know, I can't is weak. You know, I used to uh, embrace and and I understand the, the, the encouragement of it, but, you know, there's no such thing as I can't. And tell myself, there's no such thing as I can't. There's no such thing as I can't. But feels like, man, I'm like on a treadmill and I'm going backwards. Can anybody relate to me? And, you know, when we think about supernatural courage, this is what, it's, what it is. It's not focused on what's capable within yourself, but rather in what the Spirit is doing in you. I want to encourage you with Paul himself, who said in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 to 17, Paul says this, profoundly, I pray that from his glorious unlimited, say unlimited, unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through the Spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down deep into God's love and keep you strong. Supernatural courage. Now, it may have been several hours between verses 10 and 11 of our text this morning in Acts 23. When Paul gets rescued to safety from literally those who wanted to tear him apart, rip him apart, to part, like to kill him. And then the time to the time that we see in verse 11 to when the Lord appears to him. Hours. And it seems fair, I believe, to suggest that Paul was in need of supernatural encouragement because his courage was depleting. Now I'm pretty positive that Paul was sensing and even admitting, I can't do this anymore. I, I just can't. Uh, we don't see that in the text. This is in some ways maybe conjecture, but it's something that I want to ask Paul about as uh, looking in, in, in Acts 23. You know, what was that time between verse 10 and 11? I, I, imagine, I, I imagine that Paul was like, I just cannot 
do this anymore. Can you relate? Can you relate to the things that you're in, the season that you're in, and saying, I just can't do this anymore? The call on Paul's life seems to be taking its toll. And think about all that Paul experienced up to this point. He was, through his salvation experience, he was literally blinded. This is Acts chapter 9. We see the salvation experience of Paul in Acts 9. And then he was kidnapped in Acts 21. And then, then we have seen timeless and numerous occasions that Paul was threatened, he was beaten, he was arrested multiple times, and he was accused in lawsuits. He was on the run often. Are you getting exhausting like I am? I mean, Paul had a lot of things, a lot of stress, a lot of things happening. His life was, was literally at risk. And this is just to name a few of the things. We still got a few more chapters left in, in Acts. Each chapter 23 is a buildup from all that Paul went through for the sake of the gospel. But here we see the straw that bre- broke the camel's back. It's, I love that Holy Spirit does this. I mean, just this past week, studying for this message uh, at my office called Pete's Coffee. And uh, I, was, uh, I was focused and uh, really the Lord was revealing some things. And then I got a text. Karen and I got a text. We, we were, I was sitting there in Pete's Coffee studying, and, and, uh, and I got a text. And I just love when God does this. He does this so much. He's like, he confirms, like, all the time, like, because my desire is to, like, in order to deliver and preach to the people, I, Lord, like, p- please speak and preach to me first. And uh, I love, I've, I've kind of like rejected the fact of don't pray about that. Like I'm, I'm so glad that I can pray about that and that God answers. And so I got this text literally in the middle of all this on Wednesday. And it was from a really good friend of us, from ours, uh, who lives in San Diego. And this is what she said. She says, uh, hey, Robin, Kara, good morning. Can you please pray with us? My brother is really discouraged but has, din- but has been doing well for two years. He forgets things at work and has a lot of shame. He said he doesn't want to be here anymore. Thanks, guys. Love you so much. And this was my response. Yes, thanks so much for sharing. Praying for a supernatural encouragement from on high, far more than human encouragement, which it seems he desperately needs. The timing of your text is divine. I'm studying and preaching and preparing for Acts 23 this Sunday. Acts 23, verse 11, is the key verse of this passage. I'll pray this verse over David in Jesus' name. And she thanked us. And then the next day, praising God, my brother came out of the fog and is encouraged. Thank you, thank you, and more thanks. Love you guys. Of course, I had to respond by saying, let's go. Let's go. Uh, Thank you, Holy Spirit, for breathing courage into your brother's spirit in Jesus' name. Courage. Supernatural courage. Even when the well intentions of those close to you, who really see the pain and the struggle and, and all the things that are happening in you and around you, and they want to encourage you, but, you know, sometimes those, those words, we, we're, we're thankful for them. We, we say thank you. They just don't really kind of, they don't, something's missing. It is, in fact, supernatural, supernatural spiritual encouragement from above that can provide what even no man can give you. It is the power of his spirit. What God can do, by the way, with a blank canvassed life. When one admits and surrenders, and we just sang about this earlier, when one admits and surrenders, I can't do this on my own any longer. What God does with a life that says I can't. Well, I love this quote. When God, or when we are down to nothing, God is up to something. When we are down to nothing, God is up to something. Listen, church, I can't may be the very thing that unlocks I can. I can't 
may, in fact, activate what you're wanting, which is I can. Philippians 4, verses 12 through 13, Paul says this, I know how to live on almost nothing and with everything. For I can, say I can, for I can do everything through Christ. Say through Christ, who gives you strength. It is through Christ who gives you strength. I know I'm preaching to somebody today who needs this kind of courage and this kind of encouragement in the season and the time that we're living right here and right now. The second truth I want to leave with you is this. Extend grace to yourself. Extend grace to yourself. Have you ever been in a season when, you know, you're like really close to Jesus? Like he's in the, like you're, you're driving and he's in the passenger seat. And like you're, you're praying and you're talking and, and like God is right there. You know that he's there. Like you're, the hunger and thirst in your, in your mind and in your heart is oozing and overflowing with gratitude because, because you are like you and, you and Jesus are like close there's no separation. And you've ever been in a season like this, and then, and then also you have this, at the same time, a strong desire to see Christ glorified in and through your life. Like God like overflows people in front of you, puts them in front of you, puts them behind you and on the side of you, and it's like, wow, like this is amazing. Like God is right here with me. Have you ever been in a season when all that is happening, and at the same time, it like just seems like everything that you say and do all at the same time all backfires and it seems like things get worse. It's like kind of a weird kingdom paradox paradox I call it. Like it's it's like uh it's like I'm so close to Christ, but man, like this the life I'm experiencing right now is the most difficult life. <laughs> And the things that are happening, it seems like everything that I'm touching turns to weeds. And it seems like all the relationships seem to be like hanging by a thread, but Christ is still with me. Ever been in a season like this? You may be in a season like that right now. And that's okay. You can breathe. You know, from the get-go, Paul defends himself before the high council, but it seems like he does it wrong. He addresses the high council as brothers when the appropriate way to address them was rulers of Israel and elders of the people. When Paul says, I have always lived with a clear conscience, it is a specific reference to his life as a citizen, even before Christ saved him, referring to a clear conscience with regard to his civil conduct. And Paul denies the charge leveled against him of bringing a Gentile into the exclusively Jewish section of the temple. And Paul legitimately makes a human mistake by responding to the getting slapped with, God's going to slap you, you hypocrite. I think we can relate to Paul. And once then he was alerted by who he was speaking to, Paul says, I'm sorry. I, uh, I didn't know who that was. I, I, I didn't know that that was the high priest. We can see here, it seems the situation that Paul is in goes from bad to worse. The Pharisees and Sadducees just about go to blows now because there's a difference between uh, beliefs. And then the focus turns back at Paul. And now as Paul was gazing upon everyone, including the high council, now all this, like, crazy court scene gone rogue, like, ready to fight, and they realize, wait a minute, the reason why this is happening is because that guy right there, Paul, go get him. Go kill him. He's the one at fault. And then, of course, praise God for the others who said, no, 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 we're going to take you, Paul, to safety. We're going to remove you from this place <laughs> And, uh, you know, you think about this, I mean, it's like exhausting even explaining it. It's like, what, it's like a mess. It's like a, it's like a real mess. And as Paul was taken away to safety, I'm sure he, I'm sure he thought, because he was human, I'm sure he thought this, nothing is going right. You know, it might just be better if I just say nothing at this point. You know, more people want to kill me. 
God, do you even care? Do you, are, do you even care, God? Because it, it seems I'm beginning to get to that place of I don't care. And maybe some of you can relate to that. This is where you are now or you've been here. You know, God, do you, do you even care? I mean, do you see me? And those, that's, the, that's sort of the, now into the, into the door and into the path of saying, well, I, I guess I shouldn't or couldn't care either. Do you know this? That God loves to always take care of your mess and my mess because why? He wants to turn it into a message. It's what God does. It's what God does. And sometimes, maybe oftentimes, we are our own worst critic and competitor. We're talking about extending grace to ourselves. You know, a couple weeks ago in Acts 21, I preached that message. We talked about unity for the sake of the gospel. And one of my points was, and and giving you folks time and myself time to, you know, give grace to others. Give grace to someone in your life right now that is considered an EGR, extra grace required. And um, afterwards, you know, standing back there, I had a number of people come up to me separate and say, man, I'm thankful that I, I, I got that time to really pray and ask Holy Spirit, who do I need to extend grace to in my life right now? But like all three people, like individually, separate, said, but one of the things I'm really struggling with is I don't know how to give grace to myself. I mean, I just don't. And, you know, I hear the, wes- uh, the whispers are, are often like, and they lurk, and, you know, it's like this, um, what I call the enemy, the devil, accusations and lies. So it's the enemy and, and the inner me, the flesh and that voice that is, in fact, as God has got me in a process of change from the old man to the new man, which is a process and takes time and it's sanctification and, and, and all of that. And, and that's the, the voice seemingly that, be, that is the loudest in my life. And uh, I don't know how to give grace to myself. You know, and on top of it, we have a a world that says hustle and do more and become the best version of yourself. We put a lot of pressure on ourselves to have it all together. Jack preached last week and talked about this very thing, how how we just, we, we got this like, I know I'm not perfect, but Jesus is perfect. But yet I got all these things around me and these expectations are saying, be perfect, be perfect now. Like, hurry. What are you waiting for? And hustle. Do more. The opposite of what Jesus says, my yoke is easy, sons and daughters. My burden is light. And we got all these voices and all these things and all this pressure. And so this negative self-talk just resonates and radiates when we make a mistake. But it's in these moments that we most, church, we need this. We need to give grace to ourselves. It's time to make a decision today. Say, I'm going to extend grace to myself. And in Jesus' name, I'm going to tune out that voice of the inner me. And the supernatural source to give grace to yourself is through and always through Jesus' perfect love. 1 John chapter 4, verse 18. I love this. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. Love. Look, you are called to not be anybody else but you. God is in the business of extending grace to you. I say this in love. Give grace to yourself in Jesus' name. The last point I want to do here and leave with you and with me is this. And we're going to repeat this together. 
God is with you. Can we say that together? Ready? God is with you. If you haven't heard anything that I've preached today and said up to this point, I pray in Jesus' name that this will literally, like, imprint you from the inside out. And that is that God is with you. And you may even this week and beyond have to put that on repeat. God is with me. God is with me. And this is the best thing that I believe that you can know and receive when it comes to encouragement from above. That God is with you always, always. And the reason why we need courage the most is when we feel alone. But in our weakness, Christ is made strong. You know, I, I can't help but think about that uh, leadership transition from Moses in leading the Israelites to the promised land. That was the mission, but it fell short. And the successor of Moses was Joshua. And uh, Joshua, he takes over for Moses and is going to lead the people into the promised land. And he's going to be the one. And it was, I believe, an overwhelming task because, you know, who wants to be Moses' successor? I mean, Moses. And Joshua is the man. And it would require new vision and new style and new focus. And Joshua was secure and he was confident. But yes, he even lacked courage. Because in Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, God says to Joshua, this is my command. Say command. This is my command, church. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Wherever you go. He is always with you. I was not going to share this story, but I'm just going gonna, gonna to do a, a quick version of the story, I promise. When we as a church went through the transition of leadership, now over seven years ago, 18 years of this church at the time, and there was a transition. I mean, I guess we could say that Joel was the Moses. And I was the Joshua. And I'm not going to lie. Like, I knew the Lord had called, my wife and I called us as a family, that this is what we've been called to do for such a time as this, to be handed the leadership mantle and leading this church. Over seven years ago now. And, you know, I, I, I would be lying to you. I'd be naive up here telling you that, man, it's been like an amazing ride. Like, it's been pretty easy. Like, I'd be lying to you. You could call me out and keep me accountable on my, on my lying because that would be a lie. Not easy. And there are many moments, I think, from the very, very beginning where it was like, man, I, I, I don't even know what to do at this point. Where the enemy and even the inner me were speaking loud and saying, no, 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 like, you, you, you're not going to be able to do this. You can't do this. And there have been time and time again, and many of you sitting here, and even those who are online, you have run with us in this season of seven years plus where there have been so much discouragement, and, but yet at the same time, amazing encouragement, like amazing stuff that God has just been so assuring all of us, ensuring us, I'm with you. Keep being faithful. You know, isn't that amazing that uh, God does not call us to be successful? I think you and I need to know this in closing. That we stand face to face with Jesus. And the goal and the desire of our heart in this journey is to hear our Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. This means that even in discouragement, even in fear, 
even in wanting to give up through his strength that comes from above, which is supernatural, he gives us encouragement. So finally, I can't activates I can. Supernatural courage means you give grace to yourself in Jesus' name. And finally, that God is with you. Does Paul receive supernatural courage? Well, you're going to have to return next week because this is a to be continued in verse 12. The next morning, a group of Jews get together and bound themselves with an oath, a vow, not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 of them in the conspiracy. (laughs) I like that. Verse 14, they went to the leading priests and elders and told them, we have bound ourselves with an oath to eat nothing until we have killed Paul. Next week, we will look at more of the supernatural courage that God provides you and me. Let's stand and pray. As we close out our time together, after all that we've been enjoying in the spirit today, encountering more of Jesus, I want to ask, do you need encouragement? Do you need courage? That despite the voices and the sounds that say you can't give up now. Look at everything that you touch doesn't work. I just want to cast out the enemy in Jesus' name and say no more. You're not allowed here. And as a temple of the Holy Spirit, you are a canvas that God wants to continue to put together for his glory. And so I just want to encourage you, if you need prayer today, please do not leave here today by standing with someone who wants to join you in the journey because we're all in this together. And church, I love you so much. I'm so encouraged by what God is doing in you and what he wants to continue to do through you. I'm so encouraged. And the best is yet to come. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for your supernatural courage. Father, we pray more. We need more. More, Lord. More. Give us more. And at the same time, Lord, just as John the Baptist prayed, Lord, more of you and less of me. Lord, we want more of the kingdom, more of Jesus in us so that we can demonstrate and display your love through each of us. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in Living Water Church. We ask you and give you full permission in Jesus' name to continue that work for your glory until you've called us home in Jesus' name.